This is the TRW Ham Radio Swap Meet. It's uh, one of my favorites. And I'm Mike Adams, and I want to welcome you to the fifth and final show of the Radio Collector Series. Today, organized activities. Where to go, what books to read, what clubs to join, where to write for information, how to become a part of the radio collecting community. And also today, Bruce and I will finish the restoration on our Sears Silvertone radio that we've been working on for the past five weeks. So stay with us. This swap meet, the TRW swap meet, is, uh, is probably the largest regular ongoing ham radio swap meet on the West Coast. It attracts, as you can see, probably several thousand hams once a month. It happens on the last Saturday every month. Uh, and uh, you'll find everything from test equipment to uh, very new amateur radio gear and, as we'll see, some very, very old gear. Okay, this is a Collins uh, kilowatt um, transmitter. It's in very poor condition. The rack is about the only thing that's left out of it. But at one time, uh, this was the fundamental uh, starting point for many broadcast stations. Simply used this both on shortwave foreign broadcast and a few hams. Well healed well healed hams could afford some Very of this. Very high power amplitude modulation. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't thirty-two thousand dollars or something like Some that was was the, was the price uh, in the uh, early fifties for this I mean, transmitter. Yeah, you could buy three houses for the price of one of these. Yeah. Oh. Here's something interesting. Well, let's do something on this G50 here. Oh, okay. Now down here. Uh, one of the things that happened in, in the earlier years of ham radio was there was a very close there was a very close tie between ham radio and various kinds of civil defense communications, probably more so than we have today. And the fact that these two radios are painted yellow simply means that at some point early in their history uh, they were they were financed, they were purchased probably by a city, uh, by a, a city civil defense organization with federal funds. This was super technology. This was considered a uh, UHF receiver because it ran from 30 megacycles all the way to 140 megacycles. So the receiver like this was, would have been used in uh, World War II to actually listen to the radar and to tell whenever enemy radar was actually uh, pulsing in your direction so you can change course if you were on a ship or something like that. It has acorn tubes which are very unusual super miniaturized tubes that have pins coming out the side of them. An unusual characteristic of that, of that time These period. All metal tubes, um, octal types developed in the what, middle 30s well? Uh, yes, yeah, the, the technology of the tubes and everything we're seeing there is the middle 30s technology. Um, and like you say, pretty high quality equipment. Uh, if you could afford this in the 30s, uh, many hams actually worked two jobs in order to be able to afford to buy a receiver. Well, to buy a receiver like this took a couple of months' pay. Yes. I mean, you didn't, you didn't exactly go and, and, uh, and, and buy this uh, at a swap meet for, uh, for lunch money. No. Uh, okay, AM broadcast, that's the highest frequency range. Yeah, 420 and, then, and 40 are in there, right? I've got yeah. one like this. And then between the broadcast band right. and the old police band and check yeah. the shore. And, that's really amazing. Yeah, get a shot yeah. of the back of the oh, rotary antenna. Oh, it peaks right there. There's a oh. peak. You get a volume peak, and it goes down. Volume peak. So you rotate it for the maximum volume peak that you're going to get out of the receiver for maximum signal. Was the design characteristic of it? Very good bass response here. Got into right here. music there for the period, did we? Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we ought to have this on KPRZ 1150 or something. Yes. Anyway, it's gorgeous. You know, one of the things that's interesting about the TRW swap meet is you find things that you don't that you can't identify. Now, Will and I don't really know what this thing is. It's obviously World War II vintage. It must have been important uh, it, it, for some reason in, in the war. Now, it says something about video here. It talks about sync in, sync out, receiver antenna. Uh, it runs transmit antenna. Transmit antenna. It runs on 400 cycle to 2400 cycle AC. We don't know what the hell it is. 24 volt DC input. DC input, which means it must.
must have been used on an aircraft. 24 volts DC was the, the voltage level on, on aircraft in that period. We don't know what it is. Um, it could be radar. It could be just a receiver transmitter or some sort of data or something. It's amazing what it might be. It, it could have been. You know what I bet it was? What do you think? I bet it was either electronic countermeasures or... Uh, oh, that's a very... This is probably... That's a, probably it. This we is don't probably know that it's still secret, huh? It's probably still classified <laughs> top secret. <laughs> what we're probably looking at is a piece of World War II vintage uh, jamming equipment or something. Yeah. I'll bet you. I'll bet yes. you that's what it is. Radar jamming equipment, probably. Probably. Well, anyway, if you want to buy one, there it, it is. You, there it is. <laughs> Welcome to the world of plastic radios. These radios are fun radios. They're for serious collectors of, that prefer to collect more modern radios. Uh, they are not complicated radios. They're just simple, fun radios. Uh, as an example, this Hopalong Cassidy radio up here is a child's radio. And the Charlie McCarthy radio right next to it would be a child's radio. Getting to the beginning of uh, these plastic radios, we have here a 1931 Crosley Buddy Boy, which is made out of uh, molded rep wood, they call it. And I'll show you what it looks like. In the back, it's got very thick sides, and it's very heavy, very dense material, probably some sort of wood fiber content in it. We have here a 1933 Emerson, which as you can see is considerably smaller than the Crosley that we just looked at, and much lighter. The uh, plastic is very thin and very light. This particular set has a point of interest because it has a universal plug on the back, and this set would work on 110 volts house current. It would also work on batteries. Most of these radios have five and sometimes four or six tubes in the chassis. Uh, this, this set here is a five-tube All-American five uh, Emerson chassis from a 1947 radio. Has 50L6, 35Z5s, 12SA7, 12SK7, and 12SQ7. The parts in the bottom, there's not very many of, as you can see. Some of these are called celluloids, and others are just called plastics. Exactly what the difference is, I'm not sure, but usually the celluloids will have colored veined material running through them, as you see here, whereas the more common plastics like this actually have a very faint wood tone to the dark brown plastic. These are becoming quite valuable to collectors and antique collectors at this point. There's one thing that's pure fun is just prowling the shops hunting for that little item stuck in the shadows or covered with dust and and pulling the little treasure out and uh, and buying it for five bucks or twenty bucks and knowing it's worth much more than that but uh, it's just the, the finding is at least half of the fun, it would seem. Well, SPURDVAC stands for the Society to Preserve and Encourage Radio, Drama, Variety, and Comedy and it's a nonprofit organization for the public benefit. There are seven goals, and one of the major ones is to honor the people from the Golden Age of Radio, the pioneers, and we have done that in, by having them come to speak to us or to perform for us, as you've seen in some of the activities here at the convention, and uh, tell us about their careers and what they did and uh, what it was like to work in radio in those days. Well, I thank you for coming, Mike, and I hope you enjoy uh, the convention, and uh, I'm very proud to be president at this time. Uh, you know, I'm just riding the crest of a wave. It's just beautiful. I'm enjoying myself. When they said do a sound workshop for Spurdback, asked Dave and me to do it, it suddenly occurred to both of us 
that, my golly, since the period of time that we've been familiar with the organization and how great they are and what great fans they are of radio, I have discovered that there are many of Spurred Back members who know a good deal more about my life, my shows, and what I did and when I did them than I know about myself. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're illustrating these for you and then hopefully if we have time we can answer some questions. But the old thing with the horse's hooves, the uh, coconut shells, I'm sure you've all If you don't have an old radio by now, what about a picture of one? Artist Dan Gilbert shows his work. And you can meet Jordan Young, the biographer of 40s band leader Spike Jones. I'm John Porter from Hesperia, California, and I am a collector, restorer of antique radios. Have been since 1940. And, uh, so I just got a bunch here on display. John Porter is a legend in the radio collecting community. At one time, he had thousands of radios on display in his own museum in Northern California. So, I asked him how to become a collector. The main advice I'd give them, if they're going to be a collector, they've got to do one or two things. They've either got to be a true collector and open up the pocketbook and put the green stuff out, if they want to be it, or forget it. Uh, that this, To me, this is it. Uh, something that catches your eye, you want it in your collection, you say, how much is it? If it's for sale, you lay it out, you got the set, and you are completing the complete history of radio. This is what it takes. Ours is a varied collection of everything. And I don't know how many years I'm going to be around. I'm almost 75, but uh, whatever amount of time I'm around, it's going to be strictly to radio. There we go. Okay, so this should be okay then. Good morning, everyone. I'm Charles Rockman with ABC Los Angeles. Okay, now it's okay. Some of the steps I went through to get to where we are this week, uh, many steps, you saw some of them, testing the tubes, of course. Uh, I tested the voltages on the transformers and some of the resistors and some of the coils. I made sure that uh, everything was in order before I ever plugged the set in, and that's probably a good thing to remember never plug a radio in that you find or that someone gives you that's 25 or 30 years old because you could cause serious damage to some of the irreplaceable parts one of those irreplaceable parts is this power transformer which between the advent of AC radios back in the 1926 27 era and about 1933 filament voltages on tubes 2.5 volts after about 1934 the filament voltages were up to six volts and they stayed that way up into the 1950s so these old transformers 2.5 volt filaments are impossible to get what do we have here bruce what have you done on this cabinet over the past few weeks okay well first the cabinet had the woodwork done the veneer was glued down and the cross bending was glued down and then the top got re-veneered and also put a patch in here and re-veneered that mm -hmm. and then the cabinet was stripped and then the sanding and then we came back and, uh, and filled it, and then came back and uh, tinted it, and also put new boards. These are new, because the original ones, when I tried to get them off, they just, uh, they split lengthwise, and they were real thin, like they were almost machine too thin. And these are identical then to the They're Real original. close, yeah. real close. And, uh, and then after it was tinted, uh, then I put the, put the, uh, the gloss on. Mm -hmm. And also a new grill cloth, and you also, uh, well, it looks like you hand detailed the escutcheon there with the black inside and the silver tone logo on the outside. That's original too, and that's beautiful. Yeah, right. And, and also hand painted the, the black in here. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, oh, that's right. You did, didn't you? And that way it looks real, real close to original because they were all originally a real dark brown, mm -hmm. or the more expensive sets were, were always done in black. Okay. So I always try to have things that are real close to original when they go back in as far as length and uh, but even then even even then you get an occasional surprise okay I'll, I'll look to make sure it's uh, not well you probably know it's not going to come to the front of this right 
Well, it's always good to, to, to eyeball a, a, as it goes in. Uh, generally, on an older set like this, the speaker boards are made very well, and, and you have very little problems on some of the newer sets, uh, uh, especially the little tail models, you get a surprise in there because it's all not as quite as heavy as wood. Um, let's put the chassis in now. Can we do that from this angle right here? Or? Mm -hmm, sure. Hello. Uh, on an earlier set, some of the uh, volume controls and tone controls are isolated from the chassis, mm -hmm. and it's, and you can get about 250 plus across them if you uh, touch them. So that and he means volts. So. Yeah, that always uh, yeah. that that makes you jump and yeah. let's, uh, let me turn this on here. The, well, on the other side, I think. And oh, right okay, here. you're right. Okay, I turned it on. It's just, it did light up, which is a good sign. The problem with this, of course, the problem will be, you have to let it warm up. Sometimes it takes a week. <laughs> people always make fun of my radios because they always take so long to warm up. Do they, people joke with you about that sort of thing? Yeah, it, sh it should take o over 30 seconds, but... See? That sounds good. What I thought I would do now is take this back to Hollywood up on Western Avenue to um, the Home Decorator Thrift Shop because I bought it from him for $35. Now, what do you think? That's superb. Yeah. You remember what that looked like? <laughs> I wish you could have seen this thing. It was, it was, it was a yeah. piece of junk. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I paid, what, $35 yeah. for it, right? And I spent $100 getting the cabinet restored. See, it's clean inside, too. Beautiful. Well, we talked about this being a good buy for restoration because everything is here. The uh, discussion was here and the original dial, things you can't replace. This is a thrill. It really and truly is, I, uh, I enjoy caressing a woman. Mm -hmm. I get to somewhat the same satisfaction out of seeing something that's beat up and coming back into a beautiful uh, piece again. Go ahead and caress it if you like. No, not, that's not my type. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is one of our quarterly antique radio swap meets. We've got a little bit of everything here today. Battery sets, AC sets, parts, magazines. SCARS is an organization that's been founded some 10, 8 to 10 years now. We uh, meet four times a year. We're having a business meeting today after the swap meet. We'll talk about some of the club business. Our dues are $10 a year, and that entitles uh, a member to a four journals for the year and an opportunity to come and meet others and share in the collecting and restoration of radio sets. Uh, a man came over one day with two radios and uh, he wanted five dollars a piece for them and I bought them and in about two or three years I had about 150 radios. That's how I got, you get started that way. You get one or two and and you can't stop, but I've kind of slimmed the collection down now, and I have mostly Marconi and DeForest and things like that. What I'm really doing, I'm making a museum uh, stuff for everybody uh, to can see what I've collected. Yeah. And I have uh, one for every uh, variable tuning condenser uh, panel, another panel for every uh, rheostat. I think I have 40 different types of rheostats. Authentic facts. Fakes. Oh, fakes. Well, I spell it that way so people get confused, see? Yeah. That's what that means there. They're, they're, all these are fakes. This is a, this is an authentic fake. Really? Yes. It looks real. Sure it does. It looks like it belongs to something. Nat Water Kent part, and this is a Nat Water Kent part. It goes on a breadboard. You made them, huh? Oh, yeah. I make me, all this stuff. Eight, 13, give me 12. You can, Oh, I'll take this one. The ten, I took all. Oh. Okay, give me all the right. ten bucks. <laughs> a little haggle. <laughs> you, got, you got change? Yeah, what do you need change for? Okay. Ooh, I hope they are working. They've all been tested and they're working. If I don't have a have them tested, there's no label on the bottom. All right, thank you. Now, this one that I just collected came from the 1930s. 
and it's uh, very rare. Of course, something like this is uh, used in broadcast transmitters these days, too. But uh, we have a lot of fun, you know, just uh, collecting them and uh, uh, selling them, too. I just got rid of a, quite a few that some other guy wanted, but I was really happy to get this one because it's really a rare tube. This came from World War II, uh, used in Navy transmitters, and uh, probably cost the government uh, 100 bucks, and we get about $3 for them now. <laughs> uh, these are uh, amplifier-only tubes made uh, primarily for Western Electric amplifiers of the early, very early 20s, 1920 through 1924, well, say. And there are several models of Western Electric amplifiers that use these tubes. Most of them have the tubes showing right outside on the panel, you know, not behind a lid or anything like that, but showing right on the outside. And it's, a, I think, a very attractive tube. <laughs> oh, what is that set there, may I ask? That's a helicrafter. How oh, is it? <laughs> you wanted 10 here, didn't you? Yeah. And ten, how, mu how, five, much, yeah. how much is it? Let's see. There's your 10, and there's your 5. Thank you. Now, how much is that? $5. Set? For this thing. Okay. How much? You know them collectors are crazy. You know. Yeah. Look at them jump on your truck. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're looking for all kinds of goodies. There's a, a guy over there interested in stuff. So this. How much is this? I was asking five of these and a dollar a piece for these. Okay. Most of this stuff is all Bakelite cabinets. Uh, they range from, oh, mid-1940s to through the 50s. And uh, the radios in the back with the little flip tops are zeniths. And uh, actually, the, the tubes inside are worth more than the radios themselves. And try to replace the tubes, why it would cost you quite a bit more. Favorite here? Well, I don't have my favorite here. These are the ones I'm trying to sell. <laughs> my favorites are at home. Primarily the zenith transoceanic uh, shortwave sets. Okay, right here I've got a Feta radio. It's quite popular with the Art Deco collectors. It's made in the 30s. And you can see it's a little handle. And the design's quite nice. And, and also I collect novelty radios, a little birdhouse or schoolhouse radio. And then, of course, this one here in the late 40s, early 50s. Now, I always say something about radios. R radios are like people. They all have different faces, but they all do the same thing. Well, the prices on the very early one is $95, and uh, the early one's 50, 40, 40, and 40. So the prices uh, on TVs really haven't uh, gone up. Yeah, they're going to, though. Yeah, but they're going to. The history of the television goes back more than 60 years. And like radio, it is a fascinating story with inventors, investors, and creative people. I'll look at the television in a future series. There have been several changes since I bought that first junk radio to restore. The home decorator thrift shop is now a travel agency. The old radio collector's store is gone. Economic reality in the antique radio business. And Don Wallace, a true radio pioneer, died at age 86 in May 1985. Ours was the final interview. So now you want to join the radio collecting community. In a minute, I'll give you an address where you can write for information. The thing that really makes radio collecting enjoyable is to know what you're doing. Uh, most of us started out hit or miss, uh, just knowing, yeah, we liked old radios. There are now a, a number of resources available. There are, there are books available. There are clubs. Uh, let me just run through several of these. Uh, Vintage Radio itself is a book of the earlier days, taking it from, from 1865, really, up through 1929. Then we have a flick of the switch, which takes it from 1930 to 1950, which is pretty much, as of today, the, the end of the collectibles era. There are reprints now of this. This happens to be an original of a book called Radio Enters the Home, which is a very good book that was put out by RCA in, I believe, 1922. Uh, tells all about the, the neat old sets. 
the there there are, are uh, other books. There's a, a a copy of a thing called Gernsback's 1927 Radio Encyclopedia, which is is excellent because it sees it shows the world as people saw it then. Which, by the way, is different than now. When you live in an era, it's a great hodgepodge, and there's a lot of hodgepodge in here. It takes some years to to strip things down to who are the real heroes, uh, what is it that really happened, a dynamic thing is the radio club itself. And there are radio clubs in many areas now. The best way to find out about where these clubs are uh, is, is to write to someone who knows, which oddly enough is vintage radio. They'll be pleased to fill you in and you'll, you'll, you'll probably get more things than you can read. Radio grabbed me as a little kid. I built a crystal set when I was about nine years old. Uh, the, the, sheer, the sheer wonder of communicating through space, of somebody way over there miles away being able to, to, to talk into a microphone or tap a key, and here it comes into me and we're, we're, we're communicating, uh, to me was a, was a source of tremendous wonder. This is the final show in the Radio Collector series. My intention was to present a brief history of the invention of radio devices as told by radio hobbyists and radio collectors. I want to thank the Southern California Antique Radio Society and President Floyd Paul for giving me access to the radio collecting community. I want to thank author and historian Morgan McMahon for his historical perspective on radio collecting. I want to thank Robert Jensen and Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters for a behind the scenes look at the golden age of radio programming. I also want to thank Bruce Westaby for giving me unlimited access to his radio restoration and repair facility. And I especially want to thank the faculty, the staff, and the students of the Department of Communications of California State University, Fullerton, for their support. Thank you very much for watching. is now adjourned and we're going to let Ralph Clark at the conclusion of our meeting which is now tell about our contest and the awardees. I'm going to ask uh, each of the winners though to uh, if they will to tell us a little bit about their entry. Now this is a little form of show and tell. Uh, we'll start with the battery sets. We had five entries.